Well, I want to welcome everyone to today's uh, today's event, uh, this workshop here with Ecology Ottawa, and uh, I'm happy to have everyone here. Uh, with that said, uh, please recognize that today's session will be recorded. If you're not you know, um, comfortable with being recording, recorded, we invite you to turn your camera off. Uh, however, we'd love to have everybody uh, visually with us. So I'm going to start off right now by taking us through a virtual land acknowledgement. And with that said, I am grateful that we can use these platforms, uh, you know, platforms such as Zoom uh, to continue meeting during the pandemic. Hence, it means each of us joins this meeting from a different geographic location. With that said, I'm trying a different kind of virtual land acknowledgement today. I invite each of us to take a moment to connect ourselves by looking around at or thinking about the land that your body rests on right now. Firstly, think about it, the land, what you know or still need to learn. Think about the land and especially about the first peoples who have been stewards of that land for generations beyond counting. Do you actually know their collective name or names? so we can thank them for caring for the water, earth, air, and creatures. That care and stewardship is why we can still live in these places today. Do you actually know their story? Was the land stolen for settlement by others? Is it covered by a treaty? And was, it, was that particular treaty fair or honored? Is the land unceded and in the care of the first peoples or is it unceded but with object of others' desires. If the latter, do you know what's going on, particularly whether Indigenous peoples are asking for support from others? Please note that by staying safe during this pandemic, you can make us, sorry, please note that by staying safe during this pandemic can make us feel very disconnected from others, but it does not require us to rest in complete isolation from the world around us. If you know you need to learn and do more, please commit yourself that you will learn more about the land you're on and respond to calls of actions in solidarity. Now that's a little thing that was provided by an individual by the name of Adrian Pavel. And I'd like to say welcome once again to everyone. Uh, as I've mentioned, it's being recorded, and this is the first of two paired workshops at the final critical stage of the official plan. This workshop will serve as preparation for the second workshop in August after the revised OP is published, which will be a push for political mobilization on the gaps in the revised draft before it gets to City Council for approval. The time frames here are very, very tight. The revised OP is scheduled for publication at the end of July. Latest must be the 20th of August. Now the draft OP goes to Joint Planning and Agricultural and Rural Affairs Committee uh, September 13th through the 15th, and that's the last chance to get changes made. So we're anticipating approval by council by September 22nd. This workshop for today will comprise of a series of short presentations interpersed with Zoom polls, followed by a breakout session and an optional extra session at the end. You will have the opportunity to choose which breakout room you will go to. Just choose the topic when it pops up and you can choose a topic that you want to discuss when you see the options a little bit later on once they're posted up by Cheryl our technical host. One of the key aims for the workshop is to, well, a few of the key aims for the workshop is to, number one, encourage you to form a working group on the topic of greatest interest to you. And in addition to that, to help you get ready for a call to action once the revised draft is published and we see what work still needs to be done before the Joint Planning and Agricultural and R Rural Affairs Committee meetings. Please note that we will also be sharing the presentation slides with you after the session. At this particular point, I'd like to invite Daniel Buckles, one of the co-founders of POP, to give a quick uh, uh, POP uh, background. Daniel? 
Thank you, Andrea, and welcome everybody. Uh, it's a fine evening. I was welcome. And um, I'd like to first of all share with you some hot news uh, right off the press, um, so to speak. Uh, the city of Ottawa has decided to begin releasing uh, its final version of the official plan in bits and pieces. Uh, and they uh, released uh, three sections today uh, that are available on the, on the city's Engage Ottawa website. Um, the three sections are the uh, introduction, a uh, revised introduction. Uh, there's a second section called the strategic directions, which is kind of the broad um, uh, areas of work uh, that the official plan covers. And the third section is the urban, the growth management framework, which is basically the urban expansion plans uh, of the city. What we feel is still an urban scrawl, uh, urban scrawl kind of approach to uh, growth management. So those three sections are now available on the uh, um, uh, city's website, and those will be presented um, as they we see them now uh, to um, council when they meet um, in September. So we can start digging into that material uh, as of today. Um, so uh, I'd like to give you a bit of a background on um, the official plan. And Cheryl, I'm having trouble accessing my own screen. Um, there it is, I've got it now. So, um, uh, and the people's official plan in particular. So uh, this group uh, was launched in two years ago, more than two years ago now in April, 2019 uh, at the Champlain Park Fieldhouse uh, in Kitchissippi Ward. Uh, convened by CAFES, uh, the Green Space Alliance, uh, Ecology Ottawa, and the Federation of Citizens Associations. About 24 people attended uh, that meeting, including Bike Ottawa, the Healthy Transportation Coalition, and a number of others. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the initiative was prompted uh, by a presentation at City Hall in 2019. Some of you may have attended. Uh, was led by the consultant team, a Toronto-based uh, consultant team that launched the city's vision uh, for a new official plan. Uh, many of us felt that the ideas presented then and later, and that are still in part in this uh, strategic directions uh, document that has just been released, uh, did not go far enough and fast enough to address the dual emergencies of the climate crisis and the housing and homelessness crisis. Um, so you'll hear more about these uh, two, two gaps uh, shortly. Next slide, please. So the content was a problem. Uh, that vision statement was a problem at that initial launch uh, back then. Um, we also felt that the consultation process itself was uh, too timid. Somebody's microphone uh, on. Uh, it's a noise, uh, so please mute that uh, if you don't need it. Um, we also felt that the consultation process was too timid uh, and very narrowly focused on you know, extracting uh, information, extracting surface impressions uh, from residents, rather than engaging people as active, thinking, and capable uh, citizens with important local knowledge. Um, so I likened uh, the city's consultation to a hub and wheel where the city is the hub that takes what it wants from others uh, without encouraging or facilitating conversations amongst the various interested groups. And so um, that's uh, these two concerns, the climate and housing emergency um, gap and the need for more authentic dialogue uh, led to our title. Uh, the people's official plan. Um, uh, initially, it was focused on the climate crisis, but is now more broadly framed as uh, climate crisis and social justice focus. So since April uh, of 2019, we've organized three major public events 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, those public events have involved hundreds of participants. Um, we've also met regularly as convening organizations. Um, next slide, please. And we've also produced several hundred pages of analysis of the draft official plan uh, shared through many listservs and a collective website uh, called OttawaClimateSolutions.net. Um, next slide, please. So we've learned a lot from each other um, and stretched our own thinking about the official plan in many fruitful and important directions. Um, currently, there are 20 community-based organizations directly involved in uh, People's Official Plan, they're listed here. Um, some such as CAFES and the FCA re represent much larger groupings of community associations. Uh, others such as Ecology Ottawa, Cowie, uh, Just Food, uh, the Green Space Alliance, they have relatively large constituencies concerned with very specific topics, uh, including the environment, social justice, and food. Um, organized groups with an interest in urban design and transportation, uh, such as Walkable Ottawa, Bike Ottawa, Ottawa Transit Riders, and others are also part of this group. It's an inf nevertheless an informal coalition uh, that recognizes difference and encourages debate and thoughtful discussion. Uh, it's grown from an initial environmental focus to take on board perspectives from marginalized and racialized communities in Ottawa, as well as the interests of neighborhoods and rural communities. Well, I would say it's not really yet a people's movement uh, representing the full range of citizen voices. We feel very confident that we have something important to say and to contribute to making Ottawa an inclusive, affordable and livable city. Uh, this workshop is part of that effort. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that brief overview of the POP. And at this particular point, we're going to have a series of five uh, of, of uh, series of five minute presentations. Uh, with some slides uh, going along with that. So it's going to set the table to open up questions for what you and we think is wrong. At this particular point, I'm going to encourage people on this meet right now to utilize the chat box. So for instance, while the, present, the, while the presentation is being done, we'd love for you to type in words that resonate with you during the presentations into the, into the chat box. I'd like to start off by introducing Rosalyn Hill from Walkable Ottawa. She'll be uh, speaking about 15 minute neighborhood issues uh, with several focuses. Rosalyn? Hi, thank you very much. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about walkable neighborhoods because they are a really important part of the plan. And we know that in the draft that we expect coming out soon, and in some of the pieces that are already out, there, there will be this um, predominant um, theme of the transition of our neighborhoods to walkable neighborhoods. What, um, in order to actually get from the neighborhoods we have now to walkable neighborhoods, we need to be very deliberate. And, and that is, I think, where we need to focus our advocacy with respect to walkable neighborhoods. So let me explain a few fundamentals here. Walkable is the idea that within, that, that the majority of people in a neighborhood could, if they wanted, walk to their daily needs within a, you know, a short walk, a 15 minute walk or so to all their, their daily needs. However, there's a very big difference between just being able to get there and enjoying your walk and really feeling that your neighborhood is complete. And um, the, the, we're not gonna transition from car-centric lifestyles to walkable lifestyles if our neighborhoods are just walkable. So that nuance is actually really important. And we, we uh, really would like to see that in, in the official plan. It is there in some places, it will be there in some places, but it needs to be consistently there. Um, because what we have now is very much car centric neighborhoods where we depend on our cars um, and a culture that's very car centric. And so a big shift is called for. Um, so 
we need to think about and our plan needs to really lay out how we get from now to uh, our future walkable neighborhoods. Uh, next slide. Now, why are walkable neighborhoods so important to people's official plan to walkable Ottawa, but also to our, our official plan uh, and our city? Well, we're anticipating a huge population growth, and that means a whole lot more people coming with a whole lot more cars, and yet we're also planning for emissions reduction. So the only way that you can put together lots more people and emissions reductions and make that work is if um, we're living in neighborhoods that have become delightfully walkable so that so many of us choose to walk that um, we're not just all, it, it's a 40% increase in people, but not a 40% increase in cars. And in the bundle, we wanna end up with neighborhoods that are better in, in every way, uh, more inclusive, uh, more green, happier and healthier. Next slide, please. So that the imperative for walkable neighborhoods, um, we would also like that to be very clearly spelled out within the plan. And so we're looking for that as new drafts come out. Um, walkable neighborhoods are the most impactful remedy uh, for emissions reductions to address our climate crisis. Walkable neighborhoods allow us the opportunity for a systematic recalibration of our housing supply to address our housing crisis. So far, indications are that that isn't in the plan and it needs to get in there. Instead, it's likely that the city caved under pressure from people who felt that, uh, uh, fear that their neighborhood would change in a bad way and decided to focus intensification on hubs and corridors Whereas we actually do need some change in neighborhoods to get them to tip to walkability, good change. Um, and then a uh, third point, our, our neighborhood makeover to become walkable, um, which needs to involve an increased tax base, so intensification, um, it's gonna result in dynamic streets and more paths and more parks and more small shops, more places for your neighborhood story to unfold. And that is the grassroots solution for our epidemic of loneliness. So there's a lot of value added here. It's not just about where we can pack in people. Next slide. Okay, um, I'm hearing someone in the background there, sorry. So can infant and new density be done right? We would like our official plan to spell out how new density in our neighborhoods can be done right. How it can be um, established in our neighborhoods so that our neighborhoods become better. We want that to be very clearly planned and laid out. We want our infill to fit well in our neighborhoods, to enliven our streets and make our neighborhood walks more engaging. So that means we want zoning that's simple and accessible to all. Um, and we want uh, neighborhood neighbors to residents to be involved in some of the key choices of their neighborhoods. Next slide. We've all heard a lot about modeling during COVID. We realize now, I think, generally, the importance of modeling in order to understand, or in order to make um, smart choices, to make choices that get us from where we are to where we want to be. And intensification is the same. There needs to be modeling of intensification so that we propose when there are proposed new regulations and new ways forward. We, uh, we use a modeling tool to understand how those changes would result in the, in the ecosystem of our neighborhoods, what the results would be, who would live where and in what. And we, we've got to see what it's going to be like to make sure that we can all get behind this and move forward constructively. So we are certainly going to be looking for modeling in our new official plan and not just a bit of number crunching, but a commitment to modeling now and into the future. Thank you so much, Rosalind. Thank you. Okay, right now we're gonna move ahead to Paul Johannes from the Green Space Alliance. We're gonna just have a quick discussion on trees, green space, climate change, and, uh, and, and whatnot in the official plan. I'm gonna invite, uh, as I said, I invite you to add anything that you might, that might resonate uh, into the chat. And Paul, 
you're up. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I get the second slot in this uh, list of speakers today because um, it really ties into what Rosalind has just talked about. Uh, we're, you know, we're basically 100% uh, behind uh, the idea of denser, more compact uh, uh, neighborhoods, uh, but it has to be done right for it to be acceptable and accepted by the population. Uh, and the reason we're behind that is that if we don't grow in, then we grow out. And when we grow out, then we have urban expansion. We lose even more green space. And in this particular draft official plan, uh, there's already 1,281 hectares of rural land being planned for urban development, an urban expansion of 1,281 hectares. Um, we, you know, we, we, we fought that valiantly and with a lot of help from many of the people who are on this call. Um, but in May of 2020, the uh, uh, planning committee uh, adopted the uh, expansion. Uh, uh, however, um, the official plan isn't final. It's not the official, the, you know, it's still the draft official plan. So who knows, maybe there's still an opportunity to revisit that. Um, but either way, uh, uh, we need more intensification. Um, and that, of course, brings pressure onto canopy and green space inside the urban area. Um, so we need to learn how to do both those things together in a way that works. Um, we can't afford really to lose much more canopy uh, or green space. Uh, they, they are both uh, mitigation for climate change and adaptation to climate change. Um, and uh, they are both in crisis. And so uh, what we find in the uh, draft official plan around trees and green space, um, it's nice to see right up in that section two, uh, which is the strategic direction section. Uh, and in the section which was called regeneration in the first draft, probably called, I don't know what now, in, in intensification probably. But there's a statement there, protect the urban tree canopy and provide equitable access to green space that'll provide shade and opportunities to promote mental, physical health and well-being. We support that. I mean, that's good that it's in there. Uh, same thing under the next section in the strategic directions, uh, the one that deals with climate change protect trees, wetlands, and other natural areas, and use nature-based solutions to meet urban infrastructure and energy needs. We're behind that, of, of, of course. So these are high-level policy directions that, we, that we'd want to support. Next slide, please. Um, that gets translated then into, I mean, when we did an abstract of everything in the official plan that talked about green space and trees, it was 31 pages of policies. Uh, so it's really spread out all over the document, which is a 260 page document over 13 chapters. Uh, can we go back to the previous one? Uh, so, uh, but the two big policies really that are central to uh, the protection of canopy uh, is first this, uh, this one here, access to canopy cover. So there's, there's a, a policy uh, 4.82, provide residents with equitable access to an urban, can urban forest canopy. Uh, and within there, that the city shall pursue an urban canopy cover target of 40%. Now, on the right-hand side here, you see that we, in our input to the city, provided more detail and more, and and also put forward the idea that it's not just at the city-wide level that we need a 40% target. We need a 40% target down at the neighborhood level because it's within each neighborhood. Uh, where these benefits from trees accrue. So we needed, we, you know, we could achieve 40% by just planting everything in the green belt and everybody else has a tree desert, it's still 40%. That doesn't help us. Uh, so we need to really push this down to a neighborhood level. Uh, and these are some of the details that we provided in our input to the city for how to achieve that. Next slide, please. Uh, same with access to green space. There are specific policies in the official plan that deal with access to green space. In fact, this is an improvement over the current official plan where it says that within a five minute safe walking distance, everyone should have access to public green space. Um, uh, and what is new is that within a 10 minute safe walking distance, there ought to be two green spaces accessible. And within a 15 minute trip by transit, there ought to be uh, access to public owned urban natural features, so large chunks of green space. So this is actually an improvement in the policy. So we're behind that. 
what's missing is specifics about uh, how to deal with the inequity in the distribution of this green space, how to bring in place uh, the means to ensure that in the redevelopment of neighborhoods, uh, the green space that's required to be met through these, uh, these objectives, these targets, is in fact put into the plans. Um, and also that we'd like to see some kind of uh, reporting against this uh, sort of on a five-year period. The city gets reports on a five-year period on the amount of intensification it's, it's, it's achieved. Well, it ought to provide similar reports on the amount of green space that, is, that has provided uh, in, in the context of intensification. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, so what we heard in, you know, this is what the city's put out, what we heard report. This is what we heard of the what we heard report. We also had meetings with the city on our input. Uh, and we also had the opportunities to link into uh, detailed comments at the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and uh, H, whatever H is, housing, uh, on the official plan. We heard pretty loudly from the city that it's no to a 40% canopy target at the neighborhood level. I mean, and they've been, they've been adamant. We've, we've heard that many times. Uh, and yet, it, it, it's, it's essential to have something at that level if we're going to be focusing growth in neighborhoods, if we don't have in place something that's going to permit the protection or the growth of green space and tree canopy in that neighborhood, we're, we're just going to continue losing. So I, I, we really do have to push on that. Uh, this long paragraph is uh, what the city replied in its, uh, uh, what they heard report about why they're not going with the 40%. But we heard basically in words, people telling us at the meeting uh, that it's because they didn't think they'd be able to uh, issue enough building permits uh, if they didn't issue tree cutting permits. So see, it's being set up as a one or the other and it has to be planned together. Rosalind said how we need to do this deliberately with a focused plan knowing how we're going to get from here to there. Well that plan has to include how we're going to keep the trees, how we're going to keep the canopy, how we're going to provide, how we're going to provide access to the green space. Next slide please. So what we want really is neighborhood level planning that integrates intensification and access to canopy and green space so that all of these targets can get met. Yes, we need the intensification, but we also need the protection of the trees, of the green space access. Uh, and that's only going to happen if we plan it, if we're deliberate about it. Um, and that's not in the official plan right now. Uh, so that's... Uh, the next one is just, this comes from the ministry or uh, ministry's comments. It had a number of uh, suggestions for how to improve protections, actually, the stronger protections than what the city had put in uh, the draft official plan. Uh, but when you really dig into it, it's just that it's so complicated the way the city's done it. I mean, in order to really understand the protections provided, you have to pick out tiny little details from like, hundreds of pages of documents to try to bring them together. We did put together a table that sort of summarized it all and we think that has to be the official plan. Uh, we haven't seen it in the draft and we we're told it wasn't necessary. Uh, if nobody knows what the protections are or, or, or if it's so complicated to find out what the protections are, nobody knows how to defend the, the green space. You know, So you need to know what the rules are and make sure that they're, that they're observed and applied. So that's in a five minute nutshell, like as the real big items on green space and tree canopy. Thank you so much, Paul, for that. At this particular juncture, Cheryl's going to be putting a Zoom, uh, a, a, well, Cheryl's going to activate a Zoom poll. I'm going to ask everyone to fill in and to do the poll, basically asking how confident are you that your city councillor will represent your views on 15 minute neighborhoods, trees, green space, and climate change? Going to have a choice there very confident fairly confident not very confident not at all confident and here we go um let's fill this in once you've made your selection i invite you to submit and once the poll is fairly completed we will see everything come up on the screen give us a synopsis of how everyone voted mm. And thank you, everyone. I see all the, the comments that are populating in the chat. I, I like that. Keep it going, right? Um, Cheryl, how are we looking 
does that does it look like 100% of the people here have filled it in not yet okay here we go so just a quick summary you see it right in front of you uh 26% are very confident 29% fairly confident hmm 22% not very confident uh 18% not confident at all and 4% here we have it uh not sure thank you so much for for going ahead with that poll at this point, I'm gonna invite Carolyn Witzman, uh, a housing and social policy consultant and adjunct professor at the University of Ottawa, who's gonna talk about affordable housing and homelessness in the official plan. Carolyn. Thank you, Andrea. You're welcome. Just waiting for the slides to come up. Here we go. Um, 18 short months ago, Ottawa City Council was the first Canadian city to unanimously declare an emergency on housing and homelessness. Just 18 months later, the provincial government, Doug Ford's provincial government, said there does not appear to be a policy explicitly identifying an affordable housing target which the city is to establish and implement. Planning began because of dangerous and unaffordable housing, creating public health problems. And this official plan doesn't even set affordable housing targets. Next slide, please. So what we need is a real official plan to address the housing and homelessness emergency that not only refers to the existing housing and homelessness strategy, but sets the direction and also sets targets and mechanisms to achieve those targets. So a high level goal in the official plan might be to align with the National Housing Strategy Act federal legislation by explicitly stating a goal of the gradual realization of the right to adequate housing by 2046, which appears to be the timeline, and an interim goal of ending chronic homelessness by 2030. Medicine Hats achieved the goal of ending chronic homelessness. A number of big cities like Edmonton have that goal in their official plan. It would then have a baseline need assessment and targets that gives a sense of the number of households in housing stress, which is readily available from census information, the number of homes, affordable homes that are being lost to renoviction, demoviction, et cetera. It would provide, or at least promise, annual monitoring reports on targets, and it would have a five-year review after each cens census. And again, I'm just looking at the big six cities in Canada. Vancouver has it, Montreal has that, Toronto has that. Thirdly, there would be mechanisms to meet the targets. And there would be a big move associated with um, housing. There's five big moves in the official plan. They look like tentative sideways shuffles. Um, there could be a complete overhaul of the zoning bylaw in order to meet targets for all price points and sizes of homes that could meet the needs within existing boundaries. And again, Edmonton is doing a bylaw renewal that's trying to achieve that. Next slide, please. So a real plan has targets. And here's an example from Vancouver. Vancouver's looked at income categories, including very low income people on social assistance and low income people reliant on minimum wage. And it's faced the fact that you can't produce housing at $375 per month, which is what the uh, shelter allowance is, or at $750 a month, which is the amount that you can afford to pay if there's one person in a full-time minimum wage job, whether it's a single person household or a single mom with three kids. That kind of need can only be met by social housing on government land. But the first step would be an existing deficit of households that are at the various price points who are in inadequate housing, 
a sense of the household size of those households. It would look at trends in projected net loss and gain of affordable housing over the time period of the plan. So for instance, uh, Steve Pomeroy, another housing researcher based in Ottawa, has estimated that 15 homes affordable at $750 a month or less were lost over the five years between 2011 and 2016 for every one home that was created at 750 or less. So we can be creating new homes uh, quite a bit, but unless we're retaining existing affordable housing, we're in trouble. And we also need to look at projected population growth, the aging of the population, the needs of groups ranging from Indigenous people to single mothers to people with various disabilities and how to meet their needs. And then we would have a sense of housing need that could inform targets, that could inform mechanisms. That's real planning. Next slide, please. So a real plan has mechanisms. And again, we're being left far, far, far behind by the other five largest cities in Canada. Montreal has targets of 20% social housing, 20% rent regulating housing, and 20% three plus bedrooms across the income spectrum. That's happening in Montreal right now, 200 kilometers down the road. Vancouver is using all of its government land and there is considerable government land in Ottawa for social housing. And it is acquiring low cost properties like rooming houses. And the photo on the right is a rooming house that's just been purchased um, to maintain affordability and to provide housing for people who are otherwise chronically homeless. That's permanent housing. A real plan uses an equity lens to reshape zoning bylaws. And it's absolutely a win-win-win. You can have increased tree cover, you can have increased walkability, and you can have increased affordability, but it takes stronger regulation than we have now. And it takes, it would take a much better plan. Next slide, please. Great. That's the last one. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Thank you so much for that, Carolyn. Um, at this particular point, uh, we're going to do what I see. I've been watching some of the, the comments um, in the chat, and there was a particular comment I saw about uh, basically, well, it just moved all the way up, uh, which which counselor might be your counselor, depending on who your counselor is, um, your answers would be a little bit different. And we thought about that, but we're going to capture your counselors in a, in a different form a little bit later on. At this particular point, I'm going to invite Angela keller Herzog uh, to talk about intersection of climate and transportation, financial perspectives on the OP. Uh, Dinah, I'm going to ask you to mute your, uh, uh, if you wouldn't mind, putting yourself on mute. Thank you so much. And Angela, you're up. Okay, great. So we hear all kinds of things about intersectionality these days. And usually people don't mean by that the intersection of climate, transportation, and finance. I mean, who would want to talk to that tangle of things? Um, whoa. So I guess what happened is that we were in this workshop planning meeting and then people put up their hands for various chapters and presentations and then I got the leftovers. Um, so here we go. But then I started thinking about it and I'm, I'm not entirely, I'm pulling your leg a little bit. Um, I did point out that there was really strong cross connections between climate, transportation and finance and that the city um, basically wasn't dealing. So that's what my presentation is about. Next slide, please. So we've been on a journey, which has been, I, I think about two years and we've learned like the, the those of us who have accompanied this uh, um, March for two years, we've definitely learned an incredible amount because when you volunteer, you learn a lot. Um, so this first slide is um, 
stuff that we pulled together for the technical report that the people's official plan made and gave to the city, where we went through this dang draft official plan line by line by line. And we said, here's our recommendations on this, dang, dang, dang. And we wanted to make it easy for the staff working on it to pick up the balls that we were throwing them and at least consider them. Because if you give a 200 page narrative document that's about everything in an integrated way, that's not how the system can work. So some of the things on this slide um, are some of the highlights of the inputs that we gave. Um, we looked at climate and obviously it's Ottawa has a climate action plan, the energy evolution. And we drew some lines between that climate plan and the official plan, because if you want to say, well, we're going to grow towards being a low carbon economy, then we need to be generating renewable energy. We need to adapt for climate disasters. Um, we need to electrify transportation, all these things clear. Um, on the transportation side, the draft official plan already has said that um, we want to see a modal shift and reduce car dependence. Um, so I think that's something that all of the community transportation um, groups support together with an affordable, frequent and reliable public transit network. And as Rosalind was talking, I'm, I was hoping that you could also see the connections between the public transit that we need between the walkable neighborhoods. On the financial side, there's been this kind of dictum for a long time that growth pays for growth. And what that means is that developers are supposed to pay the city for the expenditures that we have in expanding. Um, and what isn't paid is the new operating costs that the city incurs. And there's all kinds of things hiding because this whole development charges is like another thing that you need like 10 years to understand. And there's like these long negotiations behind closed doors. So the other thing that already in March when we made this technical report, we did understand that there was a really important tie-in between this transition to um, a not car dependent to a public transit dependent system and how does that look financially? Because there's a huge implication there if you wanna connect the suburbs and then beyond that, you wanna blow the urban boundary um, and connect everybody with public transit. Like what does that cost? What does that look like? Um, and what does that look like in our financial planning? Next slide. So the next two slides are kind of text intensive and in part there, orient also towards the people that can't be here or the people that want to review things later when they have more peace in their brain. Um, so what I'm sharing with you here is some of the insights that we got from the consultations and the meetings with Alain Miguelez and his team. Um, and we, we really came to learn that, well, Alain, he doesn't really understand the climate implications of urban sprawl. That became really clear. Um, he really thinks that density trumps trees and he doesn't really care about the function of trees and natural cooling in the context of, of heat. Um, we also learned that the city has been doing lengthy and intense negotiations with GOBA, which is the developer umbrella group about um, the high performance development standards for buildings. And we've asked that can community participate in this? Can you open a separate session for community? And initially we were rejected, then we were rejected again, then we were told yes, and we're still waiting to see any of that. So there's a whole like, and when you look at the climate emissions of the city, the buildings is the biggest sector. So how are we gonna build differently when we're looking at this official plan, which tells us how we're gonna build into the future? Well, we're not allowed to be part of that conversation. So that's been really frustrating. Next slide, please. The OP team has been completely silent on financial um, sustainability issues until there was the surprise launch of the Taywin project early in 2021. And then suddenly staff started saying, well, what's the financial implications of that project? Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, 
And then in June 2021, when we tried to ask about financial sustainability, it's like the economic development guy, oh, he had to leave the room, take a phone call when it came for that question. And they never got back to us. So like, there's this huge like black holes in what's going on. I've also looked at the comments by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing, which is the provincial ministry overseeing the city. And um, they have some comments um, which are interesting, um, including observing that this Taiwan project is inconsistent. Um, and you kind of wonder whether that's because that's what they really think or because that's they've been in this loop talking to our staff. Next slide, please. Um, so, um, and this is the last slide I promise you. So we basically have a context and this is where like the Japanese Zen master suddenly comes up with these like super simple things that you can remember and they're like, whoa. So here's one thing, the city has no long range plan for climate finance, like despite the fact that the climate plan is looking for $57 billion between now and 2050. So that blows my mind. The city's long range financial plan for transportation, it does exist, but it's from 2017, they haven't made any changes and that's what's dictating the transit fare increases nowadays. And everything has changed, right? Like there's COVID, that's LRT developments, it's just weird. And then when it comes to this official plan, the city has not provided any estimates of the financial implications of the new OP or explained how financial sustainability will be managed. So this, this again, I mean, it blows my mind because this is like the biggest undertaking, the biggest thing that the mayor and the councillors and the staff really do in terms of planning what is the future of the city. And they haven't done any financial planning for it. It's like wild. Um, so in terms of what we might discuss in the breakout group, um, I think we should maybe start talking about how some of these proposed shifts in the official plan would have financial implications, including some savings from road widening and construction. I think there's also a lot of fossil fuel infrastructure that we should stop investing in that can save us millions. Um, and I think that we need to make that crosswalk about how these shifts in transportation mode um, will then be reflected in finance. And then I think these plans need to be integrated. Um, I've also had like last footnote, um, a message from the Healthy Transportation um, Coalition. And um, they're also saying that we really should be talking about a healthy streets initiative. And I've provided you with the link there and I'll finish there. Thank you so much, Angela. If you wouldn't mind providing that link into the chat so people can have access to it, that'd be great. Okay. Okay, thank you. So at this point, uh, Cheryl's going to pull up another poll, or second poll. And this is, uh, the question behind this one is, what things have to be in the revised OP? So what things need to be in the revised official plan before you will actually trust that it will deliver what is important to you. You'll see there some selections, uh, modeling for 15 minute neighborhoods, neighborhood level planning mechanisms, 40% tree canopy target across each neighborhood, directions for a zoning system that supports the twin goals of climate action and unaffordable housing and homelessness remediation policies and funding to meet the city's zero by GHG emission by 2050 target, uh, the clear application of an equity lens throughout, support for rural affairs across the city, and last but not least, targets so that we can have measure, we can actually measure the progress across the life of the official plan. So I invite you to, to fill that in. It really should allow us to tick more than one. I know, I was going to say, how come I, I wanted to click three of them? But anyway, um, so, so pick pick whichever is most important to you. If there's something that you can't, you'd like to have clicked on and you can't, uh, I, I, uh, I will invite you to put it into the chat. So I've just submitted. There we go. Question two, all of the above. 
Oh, Melissa, I'm hoping that you've already found the poll. It's come up for you. Okay. Okay. I invite you to, to add whatever else you might see. Targets plus zoning plus okay. There we go. Awesome. I see you're putting your additions in here. Thank you so much. And I see Councillor Menard is here and he has just it's going pretty fast up on there. <laughs> like, <laughs> <it's so scary. laughs> um, Tawin and the expansion in general also comes as part of the debate on the full official plan at committee and council in the fall. Thank you, Councillor, and welcome. We don't all have councillors like Councillor Menard <clears throat> or Catherine McKenney or Jeff Leeper and uh, those more progressive councillors. So it's nice to have you. Okay. Thank you so much for using the chat. And thank you so much, Angela, for putting that in about healthy uh, transportation. Oh, here we go. Here's the results. Uh, so 12% for modeling with 15 minute neighborhoods, 10% neighborhood level planning mechanisms, 40% for the, the tree canopy target across each neighborhood. And here we have 22 for the directions for a zoning system that supports the twin goals of climate action and unaffordable housing and homelessness remediation. Uh, we've got 15% for policies and funding to meet the city zero by GHG emissions by 2050 target uh the clear application of an equity uh lens throughout got three percent but that's pretty important so i'm surprised well we can we didn't get to choose everything uh one percent for the support for rural affairs and food security across the city last but not least 13 percent for targets so that we can measure progress across the life of the official plan thank you so much for sharing that for us uh, cheryl and i'm going to move right now into inviting uh, Lucia Morales, uh, Cowie's Civic Engagement Coordinator, uh, to discuss a bit on gender and intersectional equity. Lucia? Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to be here, and my presentation is going to be a little different. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on equity and inclusion and what that should be looking like uh, for the official plan. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So a lot of you may be asking, what does equity and inclusion have to do with land uh, use planning anyway? Well, let's step back. Ottawa is a city of diverse cultures with diverse neighborhoods and people and varying economic conditions, as well as social and spatial inequalities. With the intertwined impacts of systemic racism, colonialism, social precarity, gender discrimination, and many other forms of marginalization, um, that affects individual as well as community well-being, living conditions, everyday experiences, and opportunities and outcomes, both at city-wide uh, levels and local neighborhood levels. Many equity and justice-seeking groups, uh, such as racialized and indigenous communities, women, seniors, and those living with disabilities, uh, are overrepresented in the city's low-income population. So equity and inclusion, especially as used as a lens or a frame to view uh, land use or any city planning, um, helps to create more sustainable cities where people from all walks of life have the right to and can fully participate in social, economic, political, and cultural life. Um, so this is all to say that urban planning and city design are not neutral because the designers themselves are human, right? And we all have uh, an inherent or unconscious bias that permeates into the planning and design of the city. So the official plan is actually such a wonderful opportunity to, to define the future of what this looks like for Ottawa. Uh, so essentially planning can either reinforce existing social and spatial inequities, or it can counter them as part of the work towards a more just, equitable and inclusive city. Next slide, please. Um, so what does the OP say on equity and inclusion and how do they apply this lens? Um, so the city has officially developed an equity and inclusion lens since I think 2005. Um, and so far they've made just very sporadic use of this lens. Um, 
but this should be used throughout the entirety of the official plan and not selectively, and this is critical. Um, it does mention the availability of potential tools like inclusionary zoning or ideas like municipal sites to co-locate new affordable housing. Uh, however, it does so without specific metrics or accountability measures, which almost renders this, um, you know, moot. Next slide, please. Um, we were asked to also talk about uh, the province's comments uh, recently on the draft OP, and they don't really mention using the, the lens, the equity and inclusivity lens. Um, they just mentioned the need to consult Indigenous communities more um, when projects may have an adverse impact on Indigenous and treaty rights. Uh, and this could look like adapting Indigenous principles or listening to Indigenous voices when it comes to land use planning. This could go further, but for right now, that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, when I say our position on EI, I mean as, as POP um, and as Cali as well. Um, this would mean including um, equity and inclusion as a lens, uh, like I said, is it's essential to frame the entire OP um, and to shape and view all of its own components, including the five big moves with this lens. This is a way to, to frame things, right? To view things. It, it shouldn't be just nitpicking what is convenient to add this to. Um, the official plan also, uh, I just said that. Um, but yeah, it's very important to use this lens to foreground um, the, the frame of the official plan. And the, the idea of 15 minute neighborhoods, in theory, could be great, um, but they need to be better defined and they need to integrate affordable housing, social infrastructure and other urban justice issues like access to food, uh, which will be spoken about soon, um, rather than treating especially the latter solely as a retail issue or affordable housing rather than leaving it up to the market. We've left affordable housing, we've left housing up to the market for too long and it's um, getting worse for low income communities. So that these checks are, are critical. Um, so what that could look like um, is that cities, um, especially Ottawa can institutionalize something like equity checks through the adoption of equity oriented indexes and indicators that are uh, put in the planning policies and practices backstopped by appropriate data collection. There are examples of this uh, being done in the city of Winnipeg um, with cycling strategies uh, where they apply an equity index and indicators. Um, so looking at the poverty rate, for example, to bicycle coverage levels to identify gaps in service and investment. There are many examples in Toronto, um, but also looking outside of Canada uh, we could look at Barcelona and how they are using planning uh, to shape more caring cities. Um, and Portland, their official plan, they from the outset made sure that the equity and lens, uh, equity and inclusion lens was shaping the plan instead of just throwing it in there. So these are um, cities we can look to for examples. Um, and I'll leave it at that, but for, for the breakout room, we can talk about more measures of accountability. Um, and if anyone has other ideas, I know Denver's plan uh, also looks at this pretty well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucia, uh, for that uh, information about uh, equity and inclusion and the intersectional equity that's involved. I'm gonna move it along. Uh, uh, before our breakout group, uh, I'd like to invite Roland Dorsey from the Federation of Citizens Association to uh, join us right now and talk to us about monitoring uh, the matrix and targets. Roland? Yeah, thank you. Good evening, one and all. Um, it's been a great series of introductory comments so far. And uh, spoiler alert, if you're expecting to hear something uh, more encouraging from me, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, not going to happen. Targets, metrics, data, transparency, etc. Seven words with a lot of baggage, and I've got five minutes to do it, uh, or less. Um, so here goes. Why do we need this stuff? Slide, next slide, please. It's because they shape behavior and results. They're the roadmap that shows us where we are going and when we've arrived. And as the adage goes, 
If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. So what's needed is not any targets or any metrics. They need to be the right ones. They need to be reasonable, transparent, usable, and holding decision makers to account and for performance and results. And by reasonable, I mean evidence-based and updated with the best available data. In the context of climate change, for example, that means being aligned with the targets and metrics of the Paris Agreement and the IPCC. Transparent means seeing more than just the raw numbers. It means making visible any underlying assumptions and uncertainties, and as Rosalind has very well put it, the modeling and methodologies that went into setting targets and metrics. And they need to be disclosed timely and easily understood as do performance results and impacts. Take, for example, as some have previously said this evening, the 40% tree canopy coverage target that we are told must be at the citywide level. Why? Because achieving a more granular target at the neighborhood level would be too expensive and or would stand in the way of meeting the intensification targets. And my question is, how does the city staff know this? What modeling did they do? How did they decide how expensive is too expensive? Are they right? Are they wrong? Did they factor in the cost of not achieving the target at a, more tri at a more granular level? Where is the transparency if they don't show us the numbers and how they got them? How do we know if we should trust them? These are questions that need to be answered, not just for the tree canopy target. We need them for every single policy goal in the official plan and the master plans. The good news of sorts is that the version of the draft OP partially released today commits the city to producing an annual report on progress in achieving their targets. The not so good news, they've not yet told us anything about what is to be reported, nor do we know whether the city will consult on the development of the reporting framework. Hopefully they will. If they want public confidence and trust in what they produce, they must, and we need to tell them so. As for accountable, that begs the question of accountable for what? Is it for unambitious targets or ones harder to achieve but that risk being beyond their grasp? Well, so far to me, it looks like it's a bit of both. There's some cherry picking from low hanging branches. The tree canopy target is an example of that. The climate change master plan targets are mostly bold and ambitious, but they risk being unachievable. Accountable happens to, by making sure that our elected officials know what their constituents expect of them and then holding them accountable for their track record in setting and meeting the right targets. Holding them to account, that's on us. Next slide. The challenge is to incentivize and reward the right behavior and the right results. When it comes to climate change, that means, amongst many other things, a master plan that targets net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and preferably much sooner. Getting there won't be easy. It will cost a lot of money. According to city staff, getting there means investing an estimated $1.6 billion for each of the next 10 years, starting in 2023, and on top of that, $31 billion by 2050. Odds are the final number will be higher, not lower. If not carefully managed, the cost of getting there could trigger an overwhelmingly, an overwhelming affordability challenge for the city's most vulnerable and disadvantaged. When it came time to put their money where their mouth is, to manage a crisis as though it was actually a crisis and to commit the money to get it done, the majority on council ducked last week and put the burden on making the hard decisions on the next council after the next election. If last week's council direction to staff on how to build the 2022 budget is any measure of what to expect, the majority view of council is that veering away from the status quo is not the way to manage a crisis. As of now, almost none of the above mentioned projection costs of the projected costs of achieving the climate change master plan um, uh, is unfunded. The now standard city budget of annual 3% increases in property taxes and 3 to 4% increases in user fees and charges simply won't get us there. Is the cost of reaching the climate change targets greater than the cost of not getting there? Does the city know? We don't know if it does, and if we don't know, it intends to find out before it's too late. Next slide, please. 
So what counts? At a high level, it's everything you see on the slide and more, and it's a lot. Tree canopy, intensification, intensification, climate change, green bins, GHC, G emissions, decarbonization, eliminating involuntary homelessness, housing affordability, on and on and on it goes. At the more granular level tonight, what we hope to hear from you is what you think are the right targets, not what we think. Next slide, please. Well, this slide is just to say the obvious. Without the right tools, the right targets, the right metrics, the right goals, the goal of the next official plan to make Ottawa the most livable mid-sized city in North America will not be within reach. Next slide, please. So to sum up, go to your break room with, of your choice. Pick a topic that you care about. Tell us what you think about the issues. Tell us what you see as the right targets, the right metrics, and the right reporting framework. And if I may so offer some advice to you, it is this, be ambitious. Thank you. Thank you, Roland, uh, for that. Very informative. You know, I saw something that came up in the chat, and I'm, I'm not sure how I how to answer that. It came from Magdalene Carson. Um, she wrote, I'm not as informed as everyone else in this discussion, but it seems to me that if city council goes ahead with Tewin, everything that we're discussing basic is basically out the window. Should we be challenging the Tewin development or should challenging the Tewin development be a target? Very interesting question um, that she's just posed there. I'm going to let a couple of people take a stab at answering that for her in the chat uh, in the in the interim. Uh, and I'd like uh, to let you know that in a few minutes, Cheryl will be posting, uh, you'll be able to go into thematic breakout rooms of your choice with speakers uh, that you've heard today for about 20 minutes until about 8.30 um, at this point, because yes, we it's already 8.10. Thank you everyone for being here, uh, just, uh, just to, to add that in. We want your participation in the breakout rooms to feed into small working groups on that particular topic for the next session coming up in August. So at this point, um, Cheryl will be putting something into the chat for you. And I'm going to invite everyone here to fill in the Google form posted in the chat. There's going to be a few questions there. It'll, you'll see, are you happy with us sharing your email details with other participants in the breakout rooms for that particular purpose? So you can, can do a bit of a uh, bit more mobilization and whatnot. Uh, and the second question you'll see on that Google form is name one thing, one thing, one item that you will do before aug the August workshop to move the dial forward on the gaps in the official plan. So we're going to ask you to name one thing. And last but not least, uh, what support do you need from us uh, to achieve this? And I, I believe the question will be there about who's your city councillor, if I remember correctly. We've added that in into that Google form so that we can have an idea of the rhythm of what's happening uh, uh, across the wards. So I invite you to fill that Google form in. I'll give you a couple of about a minute just to um to get that filled in because once you do go into the breakout groups um we can individually come in and put that form back into the breakout room but it'd be more simplistic if you filled it in at this particular juncture to get that filled in and by 8 13 you will see a pop-up in front of you inviting you to uh, go to the breakout room of your choice you'll be able to choose which breakout room instead of us assigning you to a breakout room um, uh, you'll be able to you'll be able to choose one of your own okay it's 8 13 i say we populate the breakout rooms and uh, we'll see you back here at about 8.30 roughly. And I, and I, I wish that everyone has a, a, a healthy conversation uh, around all the specifics that uh, you choose to talk about uh, for the next 20 minutes. And I'm really looking forward to having everybody back afterwards and hoping people can stay a little bit longer um, to continue on. All right, Cheryl? Yeah, the breakout rooms are open and you can choose any of the five options that you see. Right. And at the bottom of your screen, you should see join a breakout room. If you click on that, you'll be able to uh, go into the options that you choose. Welcoming everyone back. 
just waiting to make sure that everybody does get back out of their breakout room. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Giving it a couple of seconds. Okay. I did get some texts in my chat from a few people that did have to leave, but happy to have the rest of us here. I hope that you had a very fruitful conversation. And Cheryl, if you could let me know if the, we're expecting anybody else. Yes, we are. Our breakout we, rooms. We should theoretically have everybody back now, I think. Okay, fabulous. So we're going to actually just share that Google Forms one uh, last time. Uh, I recognize that when we were sharing it the first time, uh, we did end up going into breakout rooms. So for those of you who did not get to complete, uh, your the google form or, or for those of you who have now changed your mind and are willing to share your coordinates with other people that you would have been in that breakout room with to get other things mobilized we welcome you to go ahead and fill out that form and cheryl has angela made a decision yes uh trust all righty there we go so the information that was uh, uh, gathered uh, by the scribes in your rooms, uh, your breakout rooms, will be shared with you at a different time. Um, and I, I, we want to do, we're inviting you to stay on uh, if that's okay. Uh, if you can't, uh, you know, I just want to make it clear that people working together on a particular topic will stay together and come back in August for a workshop with deeper work on that topic. And we're inviting you to come to our next session in August. Uh, uh, we don't have the exact date yet, but we will uh, furnish that for you. And at that point, you know, you'll, it'll be for our political mobilization event. Uh, the session, it will be held after the revised draft is published, allowing us to know exactly what is missing. So at that point, next workshop we will be working on political action items for each topic for instance if it needs to be letters going to counselors saying xyz if you need to uh do a deputation or and there's a slew of things that will be happening and we'd encourage so for those of you that want to stay for a few more minutes we would we encourage it and there's an optional uh panel uh qa uh, on a topic of trust for half an hour so really and truly i'm going to introduce this topic of trust between ottawa residents and city planning staff the developers and city councillors to name a few at this point i'm just going to ask a question we've heard that a lack of trust between communities and the city and developers really hampers our ability to reach optimal planning outcomes for everyone. What is your take on this? And what can be done to improve the situation? Um, I'd like uh, to uh, open the floor uh, for, for Lucia to start up. Is this my one sentence or do I get more time? Okay, I'm going to switch it a little bit, but um, I think it's critical uh, to do a good job of consultation um, and have that be representative, diverse, and inclusive, um, and not just use it as a ticking off point, uh, but to really either do participatory planning, that means including residents to take part in city planning, um, among many other methods. That's my take. Okay, thank you, Lucia. And I'm going to invite Heather. Uh, yeah, I, I think that Ottawa has a democratic deficit. Residents' voices are buried under spot rezonings, tower farms set, that set aside secondary plans, and overturned community developer negotiated agreements. They even uh, go in and, and willy nilly rezone uh, environmentally protected woodlots to let's put lots of houses here. Mm -hmm. uh, our urgent calls to expand the urban tree canopy for the benefit of all neighborhoods, and that's urban, rural, suburban, rather than clear-cutting the little that is left, are ignored. 
And based on our experience, I think residents perceive that we are not welcome to participate in defining and directing how our neighborhoods evolve. We're the experts on our own communities. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Thank you for that, Lucia and Heather. I um, I'm going to invite Daniel, and then I'm going to. I see a couple of hands, so I will be getting to you, Riaz, and I do see you, Ian, and I see you, Jamie. Give me a second. Uh, right after Daniel, I'm going to open up. Open it up. So, Daniel, if you'd like yeah, to just, chime in, just, just to build on what Heather has said and, and point out, it, at least in my view, trust is a two-way relationship. You know, it's a two-way street. Uh, it, it, it is a relationship and uh, whether trust exists or not depends on the history of collaboration and the history of conflict between uh, different groups and unfortunately community groups and developers have a very deep history of conflict and very little history of collaboration uh, so one thing I think that needs to be done uh, to build trust, uh, to create that relationship, is to uh, uh, build a history of collaboration and not just a history of conflict. Um, and so um, uh, that applies as well to the city, uh, where you know we have a bit of a mix of some collaboration, uh, some, but also a lot of conflict as well. And so. How, how can we build a better history of collaboration amongst the different actors? That's the way to create trust, um, that two-way street, that relationship. Thank you so much for Dan, uh, for that, Daniel. I'm going to go, go right out into the audience. I do see some hands. Jamie, I still see you. I'm not going to forget. Don't worry. Um, I'm going to start up with the hands that I saw first. So Riaz, you're up. Um, well, I think in terms of trust, I'm going to uh, piggyback off of what Daniel said um, in that, like, I'm, I'm talking specifically about Herringate and I teach in Alta Vista and a lot of our families, there were 150 families um, that were displaced from uh, because of the, the development that's going on. And I think going backwards, it was, there wasn't a relationship of trust between the city and the, and the tenants because there were issues that that they were asking for help to be addressed and that was that was never done um, or wasn't done effectively. Mm-hmm. And then later on when, <clears throat> when they were promised that you know, they were gonna have housing that was similar to what they were displaced from at similar prices, that wasn't, uh, that wasn't developed um, the way that it had been promised either. So I don't know how you can develop trust if you're going, if, if you're not going to tell <laughs> um, the, well, the truth really. So, okay, no, thank you so much for that, uh, Riaz. Uh, Ian, I saw your hand next, and then I'll come to Jamie. Um, yeah, no, I just regarding the you know the city developers and citizens, um, I think there's a harsh reality here, which is that the people with um budgets tend to be the city and the developers. Um, so so somehow. I, I think it's, um, I think we're, you know, probably d- deceiving ourselves if we think, I don't know if it's trust, I just don't think it's a, a three-way equitable scenario and we need to find a way of having these conversations in a way that takes it away from, um, you know, I've got a million dollars to spend and, and let's, that's a different conversation to the conversation that we have with the city and with, and with developers as citizens. Thank you so much, Ian, for, for sharing that. Um, Jamie, where did Jamie, Jamie you went yeah, somewhere else I'm on my here. screen. Oh, yeah. there you are. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, yeah, to take off from what Ian said, uh, you know, the developers have lawyers, lobbyists, public relations people's marketers. Um, the city has professionals of all kinds. And then you get to us, the community and mm-hmm. We're, we're full of volunteers, well-meaning people who have limited knowledge and limited abilities to express themselves. And, you know, for me, the whole thing is, is that zero resources from the city go into community associations. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, a solution would be developing community associations, strengthening collective forms, you know, like having forms like this, like maybe once a month where 
you know, the community association is broadcasting. There's a chat group that goes on afterwards, facilitated perhaps by councillors offices. Um, because really, if you think in terms of special interest groups, I mean, you know, the councillors, most of them, I would say, are very well meaning and want to listen to their constituents. But you know, it's if they're if they're not articulate, if they're not educated about the facts, then it really becomes difficult for them to com the, the, the constituents to compete against the special interest groups with the lawyers, the lobbyists, the planners, the professionals who can articulate clear plans and also, you know, cunningly explain how it's just what we want. And um, they, you they know, fluff they it up for us, right? They, they make it look very pretty, but they leave out a lot of the right. details. And I'll just give you one example. When the Oblate fathers in our neighborhood um, were selling their land, uh, they paid for planners and architects to support the community. And the community came up with a secondary plan. And then, you know, Yasser Nakvi and, and the councillors and everybody was going, you know, talking about how this was the greatest love fest that ever went on. And there, there was trust and, and everybody supported one another. Well, that's because we had some resources behind us you know when it's just a bunch of retired no offense anybody retired civil servants who you know are really putting in the time and thank god for those people and and for the other people who can put in the time as well you know we're so fortunate to have people but it's a handful of people who put out and do their mm -hmm. best against resources that are well beyond us and if you look at it like we're another special interest group I, I, we just lose. And it, it, that has to change. We're not no, a special absolutely. interest group. Thank you so we much. We pay for everything. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we do. Uh, you know, we, we are, it's, it's our money they're spending. <laughs> and um, I just, I want to chime in real quick uh, before I go to Kathy and then Angela and Melissa. Um, elections are coming up. Elections are coming up and I encourage everybody to vote. So we'll move that on. Uh, Kathy, you're up next. You're on mute. Sorry. That's okay. Just to add that for trust, um, changing the planning process itself to have a greater focus on local neighborhoods and on integrating things at the local level is going to be essential for intensification. Mm -hmm. it's, it's trust and you won't have confidence in intensification until we change the process. And they insist that's not part of the plan, but the plan is worthless if we don't change the planning processes. Thank you so much for sharing that, Kathy. Thank you. Ian, is your hand still up from the last time? I'm not sure. Uh, just yes, it is. I'll take it down if I think Okay, it okay. Out. Fabulous. Angela and then Melissa? Yeah, I, I think this issue is at the heart of the malaise. I, there was an article in The Citizen talking about City View, and they've been to planning committee 78 times, and like the community association, and never once had they actually a success. Like it's just crazy, um, and then the 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 lawyers and the litigation at the OMB or whatever the LPAT, whatever it's called, like that again, it's it's just not working. And then there are so many people that are completely disenfranchised. And then the trees and the nature, they obviously don't they don't have lawyers to hire. So and and the councillors, and it really should be the job of the councillor to act in the public interest and to do some of that outreach and facilitation mediation of interests the way that the planning committee works in this town is is that the inner urban councillors are completely disenfranchised from those votes on planning committee so there's something really wrong in the city of ottawa mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much angela and once again i'm gonna tell everybody to go out and vote <clears throat> uh, sorry uh, uh melissa you're up. Thank you. Um, I think I'm echoing a lot of the sentiment that we're hearing here tonight about the need to vote. You know, 2022, it's a big year. We got federal, municipal, provincial. Mm -hmm. um, but something I wanted to mention, which again is, it seems like we're all kind of on the same page on this lack of trust is that there's a lack of transparency that leads to this lack of trust. You hear things like, I didn't think that was a conflict of interest. I don't see that as a conflict of interest. That means something. Developer interest at City Hall is running rampant. And the way, one of the ways that that can be stopped, and that's just one way, is prohibiting developer donations and, you know, putting a limit to how much developer influence 
can continue at City Hall in planning decisions and how we build the city. Um, so that's just kind of one way that I wanted to add to tonight's event um, to bring up because it, may, it makes a big difference, right? We're talking about these three players like it's equivalent, you know, the city developers and the community, but the community should have a much stronger voice in how we want to build the future we want for Ottawa. So I just wanted to say that. No, Thank you. I, I really love that, Melissa, because um, I, the work that I do with Cowie as a Cowie board member, we definitely push for that kind of stuff. And we love to, we are good at advocating and, and it's, it's one of those things. And Fantastic. I saw what, yeah, I saw what Daniel just put in there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm yeah, I am, I am a board member of Horizon Ottawa. So that is something that we strongly believe in is okay, awesome. so, continuing yeah. with developer donations. Um, yeah, so yeah. just thought that was important to mention. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Now I saw Sherry and then I saw, I see Katie and then Stefan. So Sherry, if you'd like to come on board and take yourself off mute, we'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, uh, someone mentioned earlier in the chat, I think there's an imbalance between rural and urban representation in the, on the council and committees. I don't know if it's just like if the uh, wards are decided by population or what, but um, as all the identification is being done for me in the unit four, without, you know, and then people in Alta Vista say one time, like someone mentioned City View went 80 times. Alta Vista just said no thanks. They said okay. Like just one pushback and they don't have the intensification. So there's there's a big misrepresentation there and that imbalance has to be corrected if you want anybody in here who are trusted at all. Thank you so much for, for that, uh, Sherry. It's so Im important, you know, and um, that's why I look forward to having the next meet in, in August to to mobilize uh, what we need to do and, and get certain things set up in place and, and uh, get us in front of the city councillors and, and let's get them to... Um, to, to listen better. And even if it means writing letters to editors or, 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 or whatnot, um, something's just got to be done. And, and, um, and it, you know, I see what Daniel wrote about, uh, not the right people getting the, the young people out there. Well, maybe it's time that we, we need a, some fresh blood at city hall. Uh, you never know. Katie, you're up. Thanks. Uh, first of all, Andrea, you're a fantastic facilitator. So thank you. You've been just keeping us moving. Um, thank you. I, <laughs> you're welcome. No, very true. And I, I just wanted to say one of the things I work nationally across Canada in the homelessness sector. And one thing that is a huge shift specifically with the municipal bureaucracy is the sense of mission and vision mm -hmm. within certainly the housing department of you know, and a bureaucrat, whether they're doing, you know, administrative funding proposals or whether they're helping with planning, the deep sense of I am part of ending homelessness. I'm not a cog in a machine. I am part of ending homelessness. And I think something that we lack in Ottawa, and I don't know why, because residents and citizens do not think this way, but I think that we lack vision in general. There isn't this sense of like, let's build the best city we possibly could. And I actually think it must be incredibly demoralizing for bureaucrats and working in those contexts and feeling both attention with council in some ways, but also not brought along into the fact that this is actually a bigger thing and we can do better and we can have a full city that's robust and holistic in how we support people. And so um, it is a culture shift. And I mean that classic quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We can have the best official plan on earth. And if we do, and we lack the willingness and the mechanisms to make a culture shift will still be, you know, sort of treading water. So how do we inspire that culture shift? Um, it isn't just new people. It's also working with some people who are there. Um, and I think there's spark and inspiration that needs to happen as well. And I think that'll come from community because um, it always does. So. Thank you so much for that, Katie. I, I appreciate your comments as well. You know, just thinking back, uh, uh, maybe about a month ago, I met with several individuals within the housing uh, environment, and we are in the midst of building a housing advocacy toolkit. So I'm, I, I look forward to probably hearing from you and hearing some input on that as well. So I see, uh, from what I see, okay, Sherry, if you are finished, you can take your hand down. Same thing with you, Katie, just so I, I keep on track because right now I see Stefan, Rosalind, and then Scott. Stefan, you're up. Take yourself off mute and chime in. Um, thank you, Andrea. 
Um, I'm very pleased being uh, demographic, the, probably I'm the most senior here in the audience, but so many, oh, <laughs> Bob Robert Brockelbach <laughs> is protesting. Uh, no, uh, the thing is, I didn't expect so many uh, voices from this uh, more mature uh, audience here or participation here in the in this uh, chat room uh, but many things they want to change the change it comes in many forms and many things that is very encouraging that is very encouraging what i'm afraid of that behind that enthusiasm there will be very little in substance most of us are as i called it to uh, our fca president a petulant by nature because they are all their lives they work for the government and in a way they are adjusted to be obedient to uh, to respect the uh, the things and so on that is not the case we have now a chance we have uh, situation in the city where many things don't go wrong uh, do go wrong like transportation and so on fortunately the transportation is off now because most of us work from home so this thing subsided nevertheless i we see in our um, um, edge of the uh, of the city in orleans uh, we we speak with other communities there and we see the city as one corner in the triangle. The other corner is residence. Uh, the third corner is, some of you have already said, uh, builders, developers, no. Builders, developers, plus. Mm -hmm. uh, someone pointed out to me that he is paying more to Rogers than to the city in a year. He is buying services from Rogers that are more valuable than the services the city provides to him. We have to open up our eyes to this. That is a reality. That's why we have to think about other, other things uh, who operate buildings, who provide heating, ventilation, air conditioning, which gives us 74% of our exhaust. If we remove all the cars, According to Steve Willis, our cars generate only 23% of all emissions. If we remove them by 2050, we still have 74% because we have 3% that are transitional, uh, as Angela would say, they're just passing by our city. So they are not really uh, cars. The reality here in Orleans is if there is a, uh, a family with two cars, because they have to have two cars. Six months in a row, our street, my street is not properly cleaned from ice. And we don't have sidewalks everywhere. So we cannot walk. So if there are two cars, if there is a, a teenager coming up 16 or whatever the age to get the driver's license, even temporary, the third car appears on the driveway. That is the reality. So we have to finally get with it. Big cities like Barcelona and others, they tried to do the same thing in the 80s. What they've done, they find out that sometime you need to get to your grandma for Thanksgiving in North Bay and the public transportation won't work if you don't have a car, right? So you need to do that and they, the Barcelona plug their little cars on the side streets, sometimes even without wheels, sometimes covered up because they are used only on occasion. Mm -hmm. But cars are reality. <laughs> Someone says, since the horse. We have to have mobility and we need to do that uh, to, to move around the city. And I'm very happy that uh, so many of us are saying change, but change what exactly i said that there is a low hanging fruit like the uh, reducing the uh, use of gasoline on the red lights we have technology there only to connect it my car is talking to the traffic light on every street but they don't they are not synchronized so that's what it is 
we can do that. And the car will tell me to drive what speed to get the next green light. Simple. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefan, for, <laughs> for, for sharing that. Um, it's interesting to way of, you know, it's just very interesting listening to all these comments. I see Rose, Rosalind, um, I see your hand up. I invite you to chime in and then. Hi. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for in including me. I think I'm the only person from the development industry who's here tonight. There's a reason for that. The others are afraid to come. <laughs> Heather's laughing, but she knows what I mean. <laughs> We're so happy to have you. <laughs> there are lots of us who uh, feel very strongly about um, and the environment, uh, about housing, about housing homelessness, uh, or uh, about homelessness in our city, about equity, and uh, we people like me. I'm a, an, a residential architect and a development consultant, so it's my business to understand the pressures that inform development choices. And so I have a skill set that's especially valuable mm -hmm. in understanding the mechanisms for change in our city and in our in our neighborhoods, um, for for changing patterns of how we house ourselves, for understanding how different choices for regulating or for investing will impact the patterns of development in our city. And um, I really, I would really recommend that we all work together because uh, I don't think we're going to get where we need to go if we don't work together. Um, as someone said um, about residents, as residents, uh, we are experts in our neighborhoods and should be involved in choices about our neighborhoods because we are experts about the places that we live. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other expertise like housing development expertise. That's really valuable. We should be taking advantage of all our expertise. And I, I would hope that one lesson we take away from COVID is that we're all related and we, we either work together or we go down. So let's work together. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for being here. And uh, th the others might be nervous to be around us because they might know, they know what we're going to say, right? <laughs> and to some degree, and uh, we, we love having you here. And, uh, you know, it's something you just mentioned, uh, when you're talking about COVID, um, and, and what it's uh, brought us as a society to it's a global pandemic. Um, however, throughout this global pandemic, City Hall has not seen very many outside faces. Um, I'm used to being at City Hall on a regular basis, even with my Cowie scarf on. And when we go there, we all have our peach scarves on and they know we're in the audience and they see us and they know we're there for a particular reason. And we give all this, the television interviews, we keep them in check. So they've gotten away with a little bit this year because of, well, for the past year and a half, because they haven't had our presence. They're pushing them the way we used to, um, but that will soon change. Uh, Scott, I see your hand if you'd like to chime in. Thanks, Andrea. I, I just wanted to add really quickly, I was on the, the interesting panel in relation to the 15 minute uh, village uh, or community, however you want to call it. <laughs> and just the, the one, it, it's more of a thought. I, I, I don't, I don't, haven't really, you know, fleshed this out terribly well, but it's more of a curiosity point for me. There was just such, such great discussion in the meeting. I didn't really have a chance to chime in, but it was a good thing. And, and just the one thing that I'm kind of curious about when we talk about the 15 minute uh, village, so to speak, is, you know, part of that is, is, is work of the, the working community within that hub, so to speak, and, and jobs within 15 minutes of where someone lives. And so, I mean, I, I work, you know, for a level of government and, and I, I work in a huge enclave of buildings where it's just office buildings and, um, and, and I'm not saying that, that there's not times where that's not effective or necessary, but one of the, the, the kind of the curiosities I have in relation to the development of a 15 minute village is, you know, I've heard about places like Portland in the States, I've heard about, you know, sort of the interactivity of universities and think tanks and uh, uh, business uh, incubators, uh, such as with the University of, of Waterloo, which I had the privilege of having a tour and seeing what they did at one point many years back. 
And I just wonder about, okay, so what, what's the relevance as far as, you know, a, a workable community, you know, 15 minutes away from where you live and where you see a lot of development now being, you know, a, a first floor retail and then 25 floors of condos or, you know, that, that's sort of a, of a, of a, a plan as far as getting the, the commercial element, the, the workability element into the community, which to a degree makes sense, but I, I just don't think it's the cure all for everything. And it seems like that's what seems to be popping up everywhere. And there's times where that makes perfect sense, but I just don't think that's the, sometimes that seems to be the only response that you see popping up on some of our main streets. So where I'm going with this is, you know, is there is there a chance that there could be more of a dialogue between the city and perhaps other levels of government and, and other organizations to think about social enterprise, to think of and building that into the workability of the community so that the people who are working um, in some of these institutions uh, live in that community and therefore perhaps more people will support those enterprises that live in that community because they know that. These are the things that I, I just, maybe there's discussions about it that I haven't heard about I, I haven't heard it really anything to that degree. And, and perhaps it's just, it's not a solution to, it's not the only solution that, that will get you there. But I just feel that it seems to be an area of discussion that I, I don't really hear a lot of, of buzz about. And I certainly would like that to be part of the discussion of, of the 15 minute community, more of a discussion about that. That's I really, no, thank you so much, Scott. I really like what you just said about, you know, addressing all levels of government. I don't think, um, well, for me, when, it, when you talk about advocacy and advocating for, for the right things and whatnot and what we what we need, we yeah. do have to tackle it with all three different levels of government. It can't only be uh, just with the city because, you know, they're going to, city is going to say they don't have the money to do this. They don't have the money to do that. Um, and it's a trickle down situation. You know, the federal gives to the provincial, the provincial gives to whatever. Um, and yeah, they need a bigger cut of the pie to a degree, but, um, but holding them accountable is so important. Um, I hope that you're going to be able to come back and join us in August because these are some of the things and conversations that we still want to have when it comes uh, to our session in August and and panning out how we really want to tackle this and we have we don't have much time so no. right we, I mean between now and August I'm hoping that there can be some sort of mobilization that's why that Google form was sent out to seeing who would have been in certain groups that might want to work together to get certain things done because more heads are better than one uh working together as a team is 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 crucial and if it means that there are six different teams working whatever way Ecology Ottawa can uh aid you know, in any shape, form, or fashion, well, you know, Ec Ecology Ottawa and Cowie will work together. I mean, I'm here, I teach people how to do deputations. I've done deputations at City Hall. I don't have a problem telling the city councillors what to do. And I keep them accountable. And I've told them before that they're operating Ottawa like a third world country. I'm from Jamaica and some of the Jamaican uh, uh, people in, in Jamaica that are politicians are working better than you are. So I keep them accountable and I'm not afraid of doing that. And I don't think any of us here should be afraid of telling them what we expect from them. We vote them in. We can right. vote them out. Right. They have to remember that. Yes. They're there because of us. So anyways, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, I, let me see if I see under any other hands and just taking, <laughs> making sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing here. Um, oh, sorry, Sherry, go ahead. Me, if you don't mind. No, um, no, no. I just tried to start slogging through Mark Bernie's book, the new one. And I, I think there's one quick point to be made is that if there's no value assigned to trees, you know, canopies, parks, uh, grocery stores, accessible uh, sidewalks and door entrances, that there's no compare, there's nothing to compare to when these developers come and start talking money. And I know you know, we don't have enough time, but when we talked about metrics in the uh, 15 minute walking group, subgroup, some of these metrics, like we need to some way find a valuation to assign these things so we can compare developments and saying like, like for the stupid store, superstore, I call it the stupid store, at Loblaws, they cut down 200 year old elms. No value, and the developer just paid the fine. So we need to assign values to some of these softer needs in a, in a 15 minute walkable neighborhood somehow. And I don't know if there's again metrics available already in other cities, but I think it's worth investigating. 
I hear you, Sherry. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, and you're so right. Like they cut, they're chopping. I'm out here in Orleans and for the amount of things that are getting chopped down right now, I can't believe it. But anyways, um, yeah, so uh, there's lots, this is a really uh, rich conversation. I'm so happy that everybody here decided to stay on. Um, I know I said it was going to go to nine, but I, 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 I think this conversation is so worthwhile having, um, you know, I have children and I, and I keep saying to myself, my gosh, what's going to happen to my kids uh, and what kind of, what kind of place are they going to be living in? Are we turning into a concrete jungle? What's happening here? Um, you know, so, so Robert, are you trying to say something? No? Okay, okay, sorry. I'm just keeping an eye on everybody at the same time. Uh, I don't see any other hands at this particular point, but I do see uh, several comments that are happening in the chat. Um, I encourage, you know, you to if you want to put something in the chat, if you want to come on and chime in, I don't see any hands, but if you want to take yourself off mute for any last words before we we, we do our, our wrap up, we will be, um, Cheryl will be keeping a copy of, of the chat to make sure that we've, uh, uh, at the end, before we sign off at the end, we will make sure that we keep a copy of the chat to document some of the interesting information uh, that was put there. And in addition to that, everyone will also be receiving the presentations from tonight. Uh, this is being recorded. The things that happen in the breakout rooms weren't recorded. However, this plenary section was. So you will be able to get a copy of this and um and you'll be able to get a copy of the powerpoint presentations and in addition to that there you will be able to get the scribe notes that was done within each group so i know that you were not able weren't able to go into uh more than one group but we will share all of the information with you once it's tidied up and ready for uh, i guess publication and um and you know if there's anybody here that's interested in in speaking to the media um you know you should get in touch with ecology ottawa as well because we will we do encourage uh everyone to be vocal if you're if you're comfortable with that um and we'd love uh to work with you and make sure that all your needs are met so i don't i'm just gonna take another peek to make sure i've not missed any hands well it looks like we're winding down tim tim lash come on up. i see you waving goodbye take yourself off me there we go i was trying to wave goodbye and thanks very much oh <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. I guess um, we'll call it a wrap for now uh, until until next time. Uh, we will have some information, Cheryl and, and her team from, uh, well, the entire team that's with the POP here, Green Space, everyone, they will determine the next date. That information will be sent out to you sooner rather than later. I hope that uh, we put our thinking caps on and get out there and get some stuff done within the next month. Um, I hope that you will be able to live up to whatever you had written into the Google form about one thing that you'll be doing between now and the next meeting and i thank everybody for having attended this evening's session and for staying on a little bit longer we do appreciate it have yourselves a good evening and we'll see you soon